This is Checkative Recapped. Today I'm going to explain a historical romantic drama film called The Other Bullying Girl. The film is fictionalized version of real historical events. Many of these scenes are exaggerated and sometimes entirely made up. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. Sometime in the 16th century, the King of England, Henry VIII, is having marital troubles with his wife, Catherine of Aragon. This turns from the repeated failures of producing a living male heir as several of their children have died stillborn, and their only surviving child is a girl. This simply cannot do as a male heir is needed to ascend as a future king. Elsewhere, Thomas Boleyn is contemplating his daughter's characters with his wife, Lady Elizabeth. Thomas received an offer from the Carey family to wed his eldest daughter, Anne, to William. Thomas refuses and offers Mary instead. Lady Elizabeth questions this choice, since the eldest daughter is usually married first. Thomas explains that Mary is kinder and possibly the better looking of their two daughters. He adds that in this world, it takes more than a kind heart and good looks to get ahead, implying that he has more ambitious hopes for Anne. Later on, festivities are underway since Mary Boleyn and William Carey's Wedding is now officially starting. Anne and George Boleyn gather to meet with their sister to wish her luck at her wedding. When the festivities have died down, Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Howard, and his brother-in-law, Thomas Boleyn, come up with a plot to entice the King of England with the mistress in a bid to elevate their family's position and wealth. Thomas Boleyn puts forward his own daughter, Anne, as a candidate for this indecent seduction for he is certain that Anne's ambitious temperament makes her perfect for the role. While this hushed conspiracy is being discussed, the Boleyn sisters are having a heart-to-heart -heart in the other room. Anne is later summoned by her uncle and her father, and she is appalled by their plans after learning of them. Her uncle assures her that her marriage prospects won't be ruined, since being known as the king's former mistress would actually have the opposite effect and that she'd be married to a Marcus or a Duke, at the very least. With this attractive reward being waved at her face, the ambitious Anne could not help but agree. Despite Lady Elizabeth's protests against this idea of using her own daughter for such a scheme, a royal visit is nevertheless arranged. The entire estate has been readily preparing for the king's visit, and soon, his large array of bannermen is lining up their horses around the manor. The king arrives and is eagerly greeted by Thomas and Elizabeth. He then presents his daughter Anne to the king, and the king greets her warmly, joking that he would have come sooner had he known that they had such a beautiful young daughter. Over the course of the next few days, Anne gives her best attempts at beguiling the king, together with the support of her father and everyone else. One day, Henry decides to go for a hunt. This becomes the most anticipated event during the king's visit, and being the sly woman that she is, Anne feels confident about her ability to seduce him. Before the hunt began, King Henry sees Anne mounting a horse and inquires who she would be riding with, as ladies aren't known to ride by themselves. He also wonders aloud how she would keep herself mounted without a man to hold on to. Anne provocatively responds that she'll keep herself mounted using her thighs. The day is nearing its end, and the hunting party is yet to return, much to Thomas's concern. Moments later, the Boleyn family servant, Stafford, reports that King Henry was injured after following Anne into a ravine and falling. When the king awakens, he finds Mary tending to his wounds. He is immediately captured by her beauty and wonders why her husband would not come to court, so she explains that she and her husband wishes for a life in the country. After the initial encounter, the king summons Mary and Anne to court to be ladies-in-waiting. This disappoints Mary, who doesn't want this kind of life at all. As for Anne, she is sorely upset with her sister and feels that she had stolen the opportunity from her. Mary tries to refuse, but her own husband wants to take the opportunity because he, too, was offered a high position. Anne and Mary are presented to the queen as her new ladies-in-waiting. The queen is hurt, knowing full well that the only reason King Henry would choose two young and beautiful servants for her is so that he could have his way with them. After being embarrassed by Queen Catherine, Mary leaves with Jane Parker, following her, and she apologetically explains the queen's behavior as jealousy and assures her that the queen is actually a kind person. On the first evening, everyone gathers in the palace's hall for a party. George and Anne talk about Jane Parker, who George despises. At the same time, Anne keeps eyeing Henry Percy, who is already set to marry someone else. Meanwhile, the king enters the room and goes straight in Mary's direction. He whispers to her a singular word, tonight. Anne helps Mary to bed with King Henry. Mary tells Anne that it should be her in her place, and Anne tells her not to worry, as she has her own plans in place. Mary goes straight to the king's bedchambers, and they become acquainted with one another. The king shares that he, too, knows what it feels like to be overshadowed by an elder sibling. Hearing this surprises Mary, as she didn't expect the king to be this perceptive. This puts 
puts Mary at ease, and the two of them make love. The following morning, Mary steps out of the room to see Stafford waiting for her. He brings her to a room where both her parents and her uncle are waiting. Her uncle asks her for a report on how it went, and seeing as everything went smoothly, the conspirators move to the next phase of their plan. They want the king to continue desiring Mary in the hopes of impregnating and producing a male heir with her. This would ensure that the future king of England shall be a Boleyn. Mary's affair with King Henry continues, while Anne's plot has begun to bear fruit. She married Henry Percy, the richest landowner in England, without anyone's knowledge. She tells her brother George about this, and he reports this to Mary. She realizes that this won't end well for Anne, since Henry is already engaged to someone else. And being a senior noble, only the king can decide who Henry can marry. Concerned for her sister's safety and reputation, Mary decides to tell their father. Thomas Howard and Thomas Boleyn are both disappointed in Anne for what she's done, since it may blow back on their plot. Howard decides to exile her to France, where she would be a servant to the French queen. Lady Elizabeth consoles Anne, telling her to take this opportunity to learn what she calls the art of being a woman. She explains that this is the way of getting what she wants by allowing men to believe that they are in charge. It doesn't take long until Mary is pregnant with the king's baby. He even begins parading her around, overjoyed at the prospect of having a son. With this, the Boleyn family receives new grants and estates, along with the money to pay off their debts. Additionally, this shower of gifts also includes an arranged marriage between George and Jane Parker. However, George is upset by this because he hates Jane. Lady Elizabeth is also upset and disgusted over the fate of her children. Her eldest is being exiled to a foreign country, her son is being forced to marry someone he hates, and her other daughter is being paraded as an adulterous mistress. Forebodingly, Elizabeth warns Thomas that his greed and ambition may lead to the family's downfall. One afternoon, Mary almost has a miscarriage. The baby survives, but she's made to stay put in bed until she goes into labor. The two Thomases begin to worry about this because the king would no longer be able to lay with Mary until the baby is delivered. This means that other rival families are free to go after the king with their own daughters. As a remedy to this problem, they recall Anne from France in order to serve as the king's temporary mistress while Mary is in labor. What they don't foresee, however, is the chaos that they would unleash by bringing back Anne, who is even more vengeful after the humiliation that she had suffered. One afternoon in the king's dining hall, laughter erupts from one of the tables. He hears this commotion and wonders what it was. Someone answers that the Boleyn girl is recounting a humorous anecdote about the King of France. This intrigues Henry, and he summons the Boleyn girl to show herself and tell him the story. Anne stands and parts with the crowd to move in front of the king. With an entirely different air about her, Anne manages to capture both his curiosity and his attention. For the next few days, he keeps sending grand gifts to Anne, all of which she sends back to him. One day, she pays her heavily pregnant sister a visit. Anne accuses Mary of stealing away the king from her and ruining her marriage with Henry Percy. Mary is upset that her sister sees things that way, but just then, another gift comes for Anne, which makes Mary very jealous. She's astonished at her sister's cruelty, telling Anne that she knows full well that she's in love with the king. After their bitter conversation, Anne gets a visit from the king in her chambers. He is brimming with anger, feeling insulted that she keeps returning his gifts, and Anne simply answers that those gifts ought to be sent to her sister, the woman who's bearing his child. He tries to convince her, but Anne rejects his advances. Soon. Mary goes into labor, and the Boleyn family gathers to await the birth of the baby. King Henry is also present, as he eagerly waits in the next room. However, the scheming Anne is also there, so he tries to convince her to be with him, despite the fact that Mary is in the other room undergoing labor. Anne wants reassurance that she won't be betrayed just as the king had done to the queen and her sister, so Henry vows that he will no longer lay with the queen, nor speak with Mary. Before Anne is able to answer, the baby has been born, and it's a boy. Henry's attention is diverted from Anne upon hearing that he now has a son, so Anne finally makes her move. She tells Henry that she agrees with his vow of loyalty, unable to take Take back what he had said, Henry stays away from Mary and their son, effectively breaking Mary's heart. Thomas Howard is enraged with Anne's recent antics. With the increasing disarray ensuing, Anne takes control and sends Mary back to their home in the country. Meanwhile, the king grows desperate to lay with Anne as she keeps refusing him. She wants to get rid of the Queen Catherine and intends on denying Henry the pleasure of sleeping with her until he's able to annul their marriage. Anne's plan is going as she intended, up until her previous marriage with Henry Percy is brought up. She denies this when asked by the king, so he decides to ask Mary about the matter because he knows that he can trust her word. However, Mary lies and confirms that it is a false accusation. Later on, Anne thanks Mary 
who replies that she only did that so they can reconcile. This is exactly what happened, and Anne insists that Mary stays with her in court, especially since the trial is about to begin. The Queen's tumultuous trial results in her and the King's annulment. However, since the Catholic Church is on the Queen's side, Henry is forced to annul their marriage himself which Anne had painstakingly convinced him to do so. By rejecting the Catholic Church, Henry would have to break with Rome, thus politically isolating England. And now, Anne has to assure him that this will all be worth it when she produces a male heir. Meanwhile, a somber Catherine approaches the grim-looking king. She tells him that she knows he's decided, but his choice grieves him. Catherine then asks if he will truly destroy his marriage, country, and soul before God, just for a girl because she denies him. When she doesn't receive a response, she reminds him that Anne knows what she's doing. And more poignantly, Catherine asks where her wise husband is. You're a king, so be one she says before leaving. Graver now, the king visits Anne in her chambers, demanding her to give herself to him. He tore his country apart for her, but Anne maintains that he should thank her instead, for he is now freed from the shackles of the corrupt church as the head of the new Church of England. Henry aggressively silences her, and to make her prove that she was worth it all, he roughly forces himself on the sobbing Anne. Still, Anne becomes the new queen of England, but her ascension is both hollow and miserable. The people call her a witch, and King Henry makes no attempt to hide his budding resentment towards her. As for Mary, Stafford asks her to leave and live with him, as he will never betray her or take her for granted. Mary, however, is reluctant. To her devastation, Anne gives birth to a baby girl, who she named Elizabeth after the king's mother. With their firstborn child being a girl and the haunting political consequences of their marriage, King Henry starts flirting with another woman. One evening, Anne wails in pain, alerting her maid servants. She sends them away and asks them to summon her siblings. Later, Mary and George enter the room with the grim news that Anne had a miscarriage. A distraught Anne panics over this. Mary and George try to come up with ideas on what to do, but none of them are viable. Anne then looks to George with a dastardly idea of him impregnating her. Disgusted by this, Mary leaves the room, and the following day, she leaves the king's court altogether. Anne and George hesitantly move to the bed, and unbeknownst to the two, Jane Parker is spying on them. George and Anne try to copulate, but before George could even take his clothes off, he breaks down, telling Anne that he can't do it. Though it was her desperate idea, she is relieved and embraces her brother. Unfortunately for the siblings, Jane is not there to witness that they didn't push through with it. The next day, Anne tells the king about the miscarriage, but it's too late. The news that she committed insensuous acts have already reached him. Anne is put on trial where she's found guilty. She and George are sent to prison for their execution. Mary receives word of this and immediately writes back to Henry's court. However, George was already slain by the time Mary arrived. Devastated, she pleads with Henry to spare her sister, and he's surprised that Mary would risk her life by going to court for Anne. He hears her request and tells her that he will cancel the execution. With this, Mary goes to visit Anne in her prison cell, reporting that she will be spared. Despite this, Anne remains worried for her life and she asks Mary to take care of Elizabeth if anything were to happen to her. Moments later, Anne is summoned to the court grounds. While she's speaking to the crowd, she spots two men handing Mary a piece of paper. Mary opens the letter from King Henry, which states that he is only sparing her because of his respect and affection for her, but he advises Mary to never return. The letter also indicates that Anne will not be spared. Seeing the look on her sister's face, Anne immediately understands what her fate is. The Boleyn woman kneels, and she speaks her last prayers before the executioner beheads her. Wretched and disgraced, Sir Thomas Boleyn dies two years later, while Thomas Howard is imprisoned. The next three generations of his family, his son, grandson, and great-grandson are all executed for treason too. As for Mary, she marries Stafford and lives happily with him and away from the court for the rest of her life. Henry's decision to sever ties with the Catholic Church has forever changed the face of England, but all his fears of leaving England without a strong successor turns out to be unfounded. He did leave an heir who is to lead the country into a prosperous golden age. It is not the boy he yearned for, but the strong, red-headed girl that Anne gave him, Queen Elizabeth I. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.